So thank you for coming. I'm Catherine Martineau, Assistant Professor of Asian Studies at Binghamton University. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the series Mediating Justice, which I've co-organized with Julia Kowalski, Assistant Professor of Global Affairs at the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. We have been generously hosted in the series by the Kroc Institute for Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. And before we begin and before I describe our series, um, in the spirit of justice and in the spirit of recognizing its absence, I would like to note that today's conversation about justice is organized upon the lands of Native peoples. The University of Notre Dame resides on the traditional homelands of the Haudenosaunee, uh, Miami, Peoria, and particularly the Pokagon Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education for thousands of years and who continue to do so. Julia and I created the series to bring together anthropologists and peace studies scholars to discuss how ideas of justice thrive in particular contexts. Inspired by recent events that have demonstrated again how complex yet urgent justice is as a concept. From the systematic inequities exposed by COVID-19 morbidities to widespread social mobilization against racist police violence. We turn not to philosophy or jurisprudence to do this, but to the institutions and interactions that enact ideas of justice. So we are asking, how do everyday practices reflect, reproduce, and change prevailing approaches to justice? Rather than seeking a universal definition of justice, we hope to explore how concepts of justice are mediated by the interactions, institutions, and the conditions of their use. This series seeks to expand our understanding of how justice works including how it might work as a normative goal for justice seeking scholarship. So today I am delighted to be joined by two scholars, my co-organizer, Dr. Julia Kowalski and Dr. Mahan Mirza. Thank you both for joining me. Dr. Julia Kowalski is Assistant Professor of Global Affairs, as well as concurrent faculty in the Department of Anthropology and in the Gender Studies Program at the University of Notre Dame. Drawing on cultural, medical, and linguistic anthropology, Dr. Kowalski's book manuscript is an ethnographic study of family counseling centers run by women's rights NGOs in Rajasthan, India. In the book, she examines debates about women's rights between elite activists, middle-class NGO staff, and women who face household violence. Her current research examines how people develop interactive strategies for facilitating social transformation, both via a history of social work in India and via an ethnography of the impacts that seat reservations for, windy, for women have had on elected village councils in rural India. And Dr. Mahan Mirza, joins us. He is the executive director of the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion at the University of Notre Dame. Trained first as a mechanical engineer, Dr. Mirza then attended Hartford Seminary and then received his PhD in religious studies at Yale University. He joined Notre Dame as a professor of practice for the Keough School's Contending Modernities Research Initiative, a flagship program of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. Through Contending Modernities, Dr. Mirza implemented the Madrasa Discourses Project, where he created distance learning initiatives with participants in India and Pakistan, and coordinated learning intensive sessions in India, Pakistan, Nepal, and Qatar, including sessions that allowed for intercultural exchanges between Notre Dame students, Madrasa Discourses participants, and participants from South Africa. He is now a teaching professor in the Keough School of Global Affairs. Thank you for joining me. Welcome to you both. So the conversation that we'll have today, um, as throughout the series, will be very open-ended. Um, we'll begin, I'll begin by posing some opening questions to you and inviting each of you to respond to the questions for a few minutes. I'll read the questions and then we'll have an open conversation that follows that. So the question that to prompt you, what is the role of justice in your work? Does justice, how does justice operate as a focus of study and as a concept for the communities and individuals with whom you work? How do questions of justice shape your methods and your practice, your research practice or your teaching practice? Okay, Julia, I invite you to begin. 
Thank you so much, Kate, and, and thanks to Mahan as well for joining us. Um, so because I'm a co-organizer for this event, I've been reflecting on these questions um, for a long time. And, you know, I will say, you know, I, I study people primarily who see themselves as working towards justice. And in my case, really towards justice as imagined as gender equality in a part of the world that is pretty unequal on um, a lot of metrics of, of inequality for women. Um, so I, I focus on North India and I've been conducting research on institutions and practitioners associated with women's rights for a really long time. And something that I've long been struck by in doing this research is the extent to which transnational social movements around women's rights, I'm not the first person to notice this, but the extent to which these movements take a shared vision of justice for granted, um, that they assume that a gender just world is an obvious goal and that justice is a transparent, shared and universal good. And in fact, part of what makes it just is that it's shared, transparent and universal. Um, and so this universalizing impulse is made for powerful and potent rhetoric. The women's rights movement globally has been incredibly successful on, on many measures of sort of getting gender on the agenda of development and human rights organizations. Um, and these dynamics around kind of assumptions around universal models of justice get particularly acute around uh, not just gender equality, but gender violence, which has been a major platform for organizing both within India and around the world. Um, so, you know, in both the part of India where I do research, but also in the United States and on a global stage, so much organizing work over the past 30 years has gone into getting the label gender violence connected with gendered harms, because people in all different social movements have quite correctly recognized that by framing gendered harms as violence, that, you know, is a sort of transformative and foundational act that allows you to then act on institutions and individuals in new ways. Um, and so as a result, you know, there's been a lot of effort to sort of getting it on the page as a, as a legal and a kind of social and cultural category. And as a result, if there are practitioners or actors related to these movements that seem to be avoiding the use of this label, gender violence, the assumption is often that they don't take the violence seriously, that they don't think the phenomenon is a negative harm or a problem that they're not working for justice, in other words. So I work in this context where you have this powerful global label that's become this kind of organizing point for um, symbolizing or indexing that you are working towards justice in a social movement. So I spent years doing ethnographic research with these mid-level NGO staff called family counselors um, who were in fact extraordinarily reticent to use the label gender violence in their work with clients who were very much facing things that the, the legal system in India would have defined as domestic violence. Um, and you know, there's a whole other story there, but one thing that I was quite struck by is just um, how quick both elite activists in India as well as scholars back in the United States were to condemn these workers, to say they need more training, they don't know what they're doing, they think violence against women is okay, um, just really, really quick to condemn and really, really impatient with efforts to try to figure out what was going on instead. Um, why, why counselors were avoiding these labels. Um, in fact, there are lots of explanations for that. Um, this is what my book manuscript talks about. Uh, none of those explanations are that counselors did not think that gendered harms were a problem. Um, they, in fact, they did, and we're working quite hard to end them. But I think part of what this illustrates is that even when you get gendered violence onto the page, into institutions, you get laws, you get public discourse, pop culture, all condemning gendered violence, you still have to get people to reimagine what harm, coercion, and conflict mean about themselves and their personal relationships. Um, and this in turn often requires inviting or requiring people to rethink what healthy and normal looks like in terms of behavior and relationships. Um, and in turn, to sort of change what folks sometimes call like consciousness, right? So we have to raise the rights consciousness of Indian women, for example. So as an anthropologist, I know that even though I might really agree with some of those normative goals, that this is also a set of disciplinary projects. Whenever we talk about normal behavior or healthy behavior, we're in the kind of zone of discipline and disciplinary techniques. And that in turn, that means that power is at play here, that we're, we're watching the operations of power. And so my impulse, you know, in the, in the wake of all of this has been to look at what exactly is getting disciplined and what's being generated in that process and what might be getting erased. Um, or kind of disappeared when these disciplinary techniques become tools for social justice. So 
all of this led me to wonder, well, okay, so these mid-level staff, other women who are primarily speaking vernacular languages in India rather than English, who maybe aren't writing, um, you know, globally circulating documents or policy briefs, how are they envisioning not just violence, but justice? What's their model? And I realized that there was a way that people had been talking about this that I had been noticing in the field and that I've also um, come to sort of track in Hindi language texts that are being written by, by female activists in North India. Um, and this emerges most clearly around people's use of a Hindi word, himmet. Um, so himmet can mean strength and courage. It can also be pejorative and have a sense of like, how dare you, you know, how, how dare you do this? Um, and it, it comes up a lot in, in family counseling. It also comes up a lot when, in autobiographical and organizing texts written by Hindi language authors. And so looking back through my field notes I, and, and reading this sort of amazing body of texts by a, a women's rights collective called um, the Sangatins in, in North India, I realized that people discussed Himmet not as a kind of universal good, but as this thing that women needed more of and men needed less of. So this kind of model in which you have the circulating affect that enables less powerful people, women, to kind of overcome social norms that are holding them back, but that encourage powerful people like men um, to get a little bit more disciplined by the social norms, to be a little bit more held back by social constraint. So this is a sort of imagination of justice as a kind of rebalancing of the grip of social constraint on different people with, who are organized in an unequal hierarchy. And part of what's quite striking about this is that even as these are discussions about how to limit the negative effects of inequality, these are also discussions that center inequality because it's, it is the inequality around which Himmet gets rebalanced. So in some ways we might say, oh, that's not like strength, courage, that's just like empowerment. You know, we hear about empowerment all the time in global women's rights activism, but this is a really different vision of justice in part because it's less focused on, on the individual and sort of changing what an individual lacks and more focused on thinking about how to rebalance certain dynamics across relationships. Um, it suggests that people are conceptualizing injustice, not in terms of an individual lack of freedom, but in terms instead of how something being unbalanced about how social constraint shapes relations and subjectivities along a kind of gradient of inequality, or actually because North India has a lot of gradients of inequality across intersecting kind of axes of inequality that include not only gender, but class, caste, education, rural, urban backgrounds, and so forth. So, this has raised a larger question for me, which is how can we cultivate a kind of ethnographic curiosity about these differing visions of justice while holding on to what might be very strong normative commitments to a certain path forward that we might hold as researchers, but also that might be held by the people who are facilitating our access to field sites and that we are also working with in the field. Um, that not everybody shares this vision um, of the folks that I knew well when I was doing this, this work in, in Rajasthan. And then in turn, you know, once we learn to be curious about these different models, how do we bring them together in a way that isn't just fetishizing cultural difference on the one hand, or kind of attempting to kind of translate over the differences that exist. So, so how can we facilitate dialogue between these visions of justice as both scholars and as practitioners? Thanks so much. Thank you, Julia. And Mahan. Wow, that was super interesting. And I really look forward to the conversation. Um, and I wanna thank you, Julia, and also Kate for inviting me to this very interesting uh, series. What I'm gonna offer is a little bit of a stream of consciousness, but I hope it gets us somewhere. And um, uh, my thinking of justice is more associated to my pedagogy and what I do in the classroom. So right now, um, we're about a week after the Capitol riots of January 6th and a week before uh, the inauguration of um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. So this is where we're situated. And I'm thinking about what's going on like I know many of us are at this moment. Um, there are troops stationed at the US Capitol and we're seeing these images. Um, and if you hear uh, the newscasters, they're saying, well, it looks foreign. It looks like Baghdad. And uh, we have more troops right now in the capital than we have in Baghdad and Afghanistan and Syria combined. And so when I hear this, I'm like, no, 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 this is maybe foreign to you, but this is how America actually looks like. 
to a lot of the world outside. And what does this have to do with justice? Karma, you know, I'm thinking of <laughs> like a sense of you get, you know, what you deserve, you reap what you sow. And in this, you know, uh, when I'm thinking of justice in this sense, I'm thinking of maybe fairness uh, is a word that comes to mind. Maybe what we do elsewhere is not really fair. When we experience it ourselves, uh, we, realize, um, we realize that. Um, when we think about um, uh, maybe how others feel, it also opens up you know, the, a door to, to empathy and this idea that being able to have that quality is fundamental to a sense of justice. And it's not just about facts, you know, cold analysis, but it's also about narratives and how different people perceive uh, the presence of groups within broader uh, stories about who we are. And this kind of perspective shift shifting is you know, really important to me when I teach. So I'll give you an example. Uh, in our Islam and global affairs class, uh, that particular class I taught it for the first time. I'm developing new classes for, for the Keo School at the Ansari Institute. And so we were talking about Islam and Islamic law within the framework of uh, religion and politics. And when we came to schools of law, uh, there's a tremendous diversity in Islamic uh, jurisprudence. A different, there are different legal methodologies and um, when that comes up, you know, some students begin to say, well, obviously it's not workable, right? Uh, it, how are you going to have a, a political system that has so much legal diversity? And I'm like, you know, this was, this conversation was taking place as the Amy Coney Barrett debates um, were taking place. So I'm like, talk about legal um, pluralism. We have that here. Uh, you have conservative judges, you have progressive judges, and there is a contest on who gets nominated and who gets appointed. But, and there's a healthy debate in academia um, on all of this, but we have institutions that help us stabilize um, the legal system and also legitimize it. So why, what makes us think the same thing can't happen in other, uh, in other traditions? And you know, if you come back to occupation, we play the same game when we think about occupation. So the US sends troops to other places for all sorts of reasons. Um, among these ostensibly uh, stated reasons uh, to spread democracy, uh, to protect the rights of minorities. So, so let's flip it around. What if you had, and obviously there's resources involved, um, energy and oil. So like, what if we were a resource rich country that a more powerful country wanted to take advantage of? And they come in and say, well, wait a minute, you also have serious problem with your minorities. There's injustices with African Americans, historic injustices, systemic racism. Uh, there's been genocide of the native population. So why don't you just rearrange your government and uh, give more representation to blacks and let's carve out Oklahoma. Why don't you, you know, give it back to the natives. Um, there's 49 other states where you can just you know, move over to, don't you have enough room? And so I try to get them to think how these kinds of arguments sound if they were applied back to us. And I think this does kind of for a moment um, invite students um, to think differently about issues that were you to just focus on uh, a different kind of fact-based analysis um, wouldn't um, inspire that kind of introspection. Um, okay, so the idea of justice here is actually quite simple, I think. There's a golden rule. Um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, and there's a situatedness in that, right? Because everyone's situated. Um, you're in a particular situation. You have to know that situation. You have to be able to put yourselves in someone else's shoes. And then imagine what would it would feel like for something to be right and to be just. Um, there's spiritual principles involved, like take the log out of your own eye. I think it le leads to that before worrying about the speck in the others. This doesn't mean that you disregard injustice if you see it elsewhere, but don't forget 
what's happening in your own home. Um, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad you know, captures this idea. None of you truly believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And I can see in the gender language, uh, there's some work to do here, all right? Especially today, uh, it, it, it needs to mean, mean brother and sister. It needs to mean, and, and that's still a binary, so I know people are going to critique that. Um, so it, it has to go even beyond that, right? It, it's Muslim and non-Muslim. Uh, but once we understand the underlying principle and we begin to see that the world, at least uh, our, um, the way we see the world, is moving beyond non-binary, then does that mean that those same principles are going to take us to new places? I really like uh, John Rawls's theory of justice. So, you know, he has this idea of the original position. Now imagine yourself, so abstract yourself from where you are and imagine yourself as being uh, in this, uh, you're not embodied yet in any place in society. And uh, you could, but you could wind up in any particular situation. You could be a man, a woman, or uh, transgender, you could be a Muslim, you could be a, a, of another religion, you could be a nun, N-O-N-E. Um, and so how would you make rules that were you to wind up in any of these positions, uh, you would find them fair? Now, it's a great idea, but I think it's unworkable. The reason it's unworkable is because we're all situated. And I don't think that people have the ability to um, engage in that kind of radical empathy. And, and that brings me to the idea of theology. So the idea of justice in, in, in at least uh, perspectives in Islamic theology are, there's only one being in an original position and that's God. So God is lawgiver. God gives the laws and he knows everybody's situation. God knows. And God is able to then uh, give laws um, that are ultimately just. Obviously, we know that um, uh, that doesn't work either uh, in, in practice because um, people have to interpret God's word. And you're back to uh, reading uh, Revelation uh, from your particular situation. So... Where does that leave us? Uh, let me just conclude by, uh, you know, putting something out there for conversation and um, we'll take it from there. So, and I think this connects with what Julia, what you were saying, how the, the question you asked right at the end is that we have these norms, but then how do you go into ethnographic situations where um, different norms function? And then, uh, uh, inculcate a kind of curiosity in that world despite your own convictions and then generate a dialogue between the two. And so in a sense, uh, from a theological perspective, absolute justice is only in the hereafter. It doesn't happen in this world. But in this world, you have to do the best you can in whatever situation you find yourself in. So there's a wonderful dyad uh, in the Quran uh, verses where it says, be just and don't let your enmity of a people, your hatred of a people keep you from being just. And then the other verse says, be just even if it's against your own selves. And so how can we uh, inculcate uh, an ability in ourselves to be fair, even when it's with our perceived enemies, or even when it's against our own selves and our self-interest. I'll just leave it there and uh, look forward to, to the conversation. Thank you. That uh, raises so many questions for me um, and both of your talks did. I think the place I'd like to start is by thinking more about, and I'm, I'm really, um, I guess prompted or in some way really, I feel like you uh, like were 
needling me a little bit there, Ivan. I'm sure it wasn't personal. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> in, in thinking about this, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself. Mm -hmm. um, when, you know, exactly what um, many of the situations that anthropologists are looking at are precisely where what people want for themselves is not what other people want. Right. So that, in fact, people really sometimes want very different things or they imagine the world in very different ways. And you and I want to push back with you because you're involved in these projects that are precisely about this in pluralism, like these religious plurality projects um, and contending modernities is is, in my understanding, exactly this kind of question. And so, you know, Julia had posed that, you know, her case of um, thinking about Himat as an alternative for thinking about, you know, kind of um, equities of liberty, which is how we often think about justice here in the United States, right? And if you start thinking about Himat instead, um, then what one person wants is quite different from what another person wants. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, how, how does that play out for both of you? You know, this tension between... Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, take it a step further the same principle. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. But in applying that principle, you have to know what it's the other one wants. Like the other person would want you to do what they want, just like you would want, want them to do what you want. The other person wants to be understood, just like you want to be understood. So understand them and then help them achieve what they want. And if you think that's totally wrong, then there needs to be a, a, a kind of conversation, right? It gets, it, gets, it gets messy, but I think there are ways to still keep that principle intact while complicating it. Yeah, and I hear you moving toward this question of translation, which is where Julia yeah. left us. Julia, do you wanna respond to? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think one thing I'm thinking about here is the sort of unit of, of analysis as we, I, I, can't, I think that's the best way to put it, the sort of unit of analysis as we ask these questions about justice. And I think, you know, thinking in a kind of liberal tradition with Rawls, the unit of analysis is the individual and the individual kind of exists before he or she enters into relations with others. And so we're sort of working, you know, it's that this idea that we could like sort of extract, if we could just extract everybody out of all that relationality and noise, we could get at, you know, I'm oversimplifying a lot here, I recognize, we can kind of get at what justice really is. And um, and that's, that's certainly one way to think about it. Um, I think there've been a lot of critiques of that approach in, um, feminist political theory and anthropology and other disciplines that are thinking really deeply about relationality because in fact, we never become an individual outside of relations. That this kind of individual is maybe even a fiction of a certain set of political ideologies. I'm not weighing in on that. That's just what some, some scholars say, um, who I think are pretty convincing. Um, but so, you know, I think one thing that we could, we could think about are the ways in which um, we have to become alert, not only to different, like, the, the sense that oh different individuals might you know have a different you know have a different answer to the question of like what do you want for yourself or do unto others as you like what would you have done to yourself um, we have to move beyond that into recognizing that in fact different groups might conceptualize justice as having a different unit of analysis that that justice might not be just about the individual but about the larger relationships that produce individuals that act on the world or the larger social structures that might constrain what seem like or appear to be choices. Um, so I think that's kind of in thinking about the sort of estranging comparison you were suggesting of like, well, what would it look like to imagine what's happening in the capital right now is almost like a colonial occupation. Like, how does that shift how I, how I see and think about current events, you know, that kind of estranging comparison can also help us, I think, get beyond these very individualizing um, models of justice um, and help us get beyond as well thinking that the just, the individual is like the telos of justice, which I think is something that it, seeps out of roles and thinking sometimes. Do you want to respond, Mahan, or should I? <laughs> no, go ahead. I, I find that very interesting. I don't think that, you know, part of my, my um, I think, problem with roles was the exact same point that you, you articulated, which is it's impossible to extract yourself. And I do think it's, a, it's an interesting 
idea in the abstract, but it doesn't work in the real world simply because we're so tied to material reality systems relations. And my personal, my feeling is that that network of relations with an individual connected to what is outside of them in society, people, political systems, social structures, that they're so compl uh, complex for every individual, how they've been raised, that ultimately, you know, thinking of justice as being achievable in a universal kind of framework is something that may be beyond at least my capability. My capability is to recognize where I am and then do the best from that vantage. And in that sense, the individual still is at the center. So I'm, I'm, I'm I keep going back to this uh, situation in the capital that we're talking mm -hmm. about. Um, and I, I love the comparison that you've made and the sense of, you know, you reap what you sow. And I don't think that that has to be cosmological. It can actually be structural in the institution. Like we are this, <laughs> right? <laughs> These are our institutions. These are the world we've created. This is the world we've created. It's, it's no surprise kind of causally that this is where we've ended up. Um, and, and I guess, you know, part of, and I really um, feel uh, that this, um, passage from the Quran that you described where you don't, if I, I'm going to get it wrong, but don't let your enmity for people um, distract you from being just, right? And I feel like that is a, a huge challenge for me as I think about what's happening in the capital, because in many ways I want to approach this as war, right? Like, oh, we are in a war. That's what they want. They've got it, you know? Um, and, and I guess I'm I, I'm really pulled by the work that both of you are doing toward, and Julia, I think to some way, I wonder if your work on feminism and women's rights discourses in India provides an interesting comparative case for this. Um, because there, um, there is only a right way to talk about gendered violence, right? And understanding the causes of gendered violence in a nuanced way can sometimes seem to undercut that project, right? And similarly, I've been thinking about white supremacy in the United States and how it really is a problem that exists, right? And we can't just make these people go away. <laughs> so we need to somehow understand the causes of that at the same time that we reject what it produces. Right. And, and the, the whole institution that it's a part of, I don't want to be a part of that. Right. I want to reject the institution. So I just, I would really like to invite both of you, if you could reflect a little bit on what does your perspective bring to the problem of white supremacy in the United States? I'm sorry to make it so targeted, but I really, this is where I am. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's interesting that, again, in, in the spirit of like an estranging comparison, you know, to step back and say, well, what, what do these people that mobbed the Capitol, they thought, I mean, they think they're fighting for justice. I think if you, if you read these interviews that people did, I mean, we, we don't know everything that these folks think yet, but they, they think they're, I mean, you know, there's that woman at the speaker's dais with the sign that said like, save the children or something, but this is, this is a, a vision of justice that is so clearly not my vision of justice and um or what i want my society to be and it feels viscerally uncomfortable to put my ethnographer brain on about that because it does feel like it's sitting with i don't know it feels like both sides is them almost right like oh i'm gonna sit with these white supremacists and see what like what do they think justice is um but you know, on the flip side, it, it's hard to know how to come to any kind of end to this without taking seriously and, and not just dismissing as empty rhetoric or as a kind of 
uh, fig leaf over overt racism, but but taking quite seriously like the vision of justice that that these folks are are operating under and, and trying to understand how to how it motivates them to act. And every time I read about the kinds of conspiracies that are animating these movements, I think I do not understand this. Like there's there's like something behind this animating this that I have no purchase on, mm. um, which is a scary way to feel about people who live in our town. Um, mm. Yeah, and so I guess that's not that's not any kind of answer, but um, I, I do think there's a there's a requirement that we do need to take seriously not white supremacy as an argument for the social good, but rather looking at the ways in which maybe a history of white structural white supremacy have distorted ideas about what justice looks like to some people. Yeah, so you know, I think. This is really, you nailed it, Julia. Like, what would it mean to inculcate the ethnographic curiosity? Like you asked this, this question about the, the Indians. Um, and so the same question pertains here. And I think underlying it is the meta question is how do we come to terms with difference like if, if we genuinely have different conceptions of the world, is there a way that we can live with that, un understand that difference, even empath empathize with it without necessarily agreeing with it, and then allow it to inhabit our world and make peace with it? Obviously, you need both sides to tango, um, but uh, I think it is comprehensible. I mean, Arlie Rothschild, who did the ethnographic work in the South, strangers in their own land. And she helps us understand the reality of the far right through a deep story. And she creates this amazing imagery of, you know, imagine a long line. And it's mostly these uh, white um, uh, Christians, mostly male, they're standing in this line. At the end of the line is the American dream, but the line has stopped and um, it's no longer moving. And in fact, there are people who are cutting in line and it's people who are not like them. They're not Christian in the way they're Christian. And they're being held by politicians who are not like them, who are liberal and who are using the government to change our textbooks, our laws, our values to make us some, something different from who we are. And so regardless of agreement, it's quite comprehensible. Um, the grievance and the concern that uh, is represented and certainly a resentment that's exploited by politicians, instead of helping us try to reconcile our adversarial political system with its rhetorical instruments is uh, uh, serves to deepen divides instead of bridge divides for sh short-term political gain, just like economics works on short-term political gain and we're destroying the planet. And so there, uh, I think we, if we can understand this and then you have, uh, uh, are able to at least have conversations with your neighbors. And that's a start um, at the systemic level, I think we need to change the operating system uh, that gives rise to these kinds of uh, divisions. And if that doesn't happen, it may just be that um, war is the inevitable outcome. And we know that um, uh, there's lots of benefits associated to a certain class with war as well. The that the harsh shield is like such a great example, right? Because I think it is, it's very easy to agree that it's not fair to cut in line, right? Like it's not, that's all fair if somebody cuts you in line. It's not fair, like people are cutting in line for the vaccine right now. It's not fair, like that's such a, a shared, like visceral sense in American culture. But so then the, the question is like, well, what's the, what's the next step? Do you try to re-narrate so that it no longer feels like people are being cut in line? Do you try to teach people it's not a line, you're not waiting in line? Do you change the system so that there's, I mean, all of this, right, is a kind of scarcity mentality that many, many scholars have shown to be deeply connected, in fact, with white supremacy in the United States, right? That this, this idea that like somebody else's gain is my loss, in fact, is has deep historical roots in the racial bribe and, and all these other dynamics. And so 
you know, yeah, it, it almost feels like then the, the place to go is to say, yes, it's terrible to cut in line, but we're not waiting in a line like we're marching in a parade or where, I, I don't know. I don't know what the other deep story would have to be, but um, yeah, which I think comes back to your point about situatedness and narrative and the sort of role of that in, in, thinking, in thinking justice. Yeah. yeah, and so I think, you know, our situation, the human situation is one of um, contending stories. And it reminds me of Martin Luther King Jr. back in 67, his last book, Chaos or Community. His last chapter is The World House. And he quotes from a novelist who, from a, one of his unpublished stories where he starts a story that says, you know, a widely dispersed family inherits a house and they all have to figure out how to live in it. And that's a metaphor for humanity. So we have to figure out um, what maybe our story is within which all these other stories fit and then try to have a, a conversation. Thank you. And I wish we could go on. This is wonderful, but our conversation has far exceeded our allotted time already. But I, I really appreciate you um, indulging my questions, which I know are off your area of you know, expertise, but yet I feel it's really important to bring our areas of expertise to these um, current moments. And I thank you both for joining in that. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, conclude and um, I wanna thank you both for joining today. Uh, and we'd like to thank everyone at the Kroc Institute for their support, especially the director of Kroc, Asher Kaufman, communications director, Hannah Heinziker, and events manager, Lisa Gallagher. We invite you to watch our other dialogues during February and March, and to join us for our series Capstone Live event on April 7th with Professor Kamari Maxine Clark, professor of anthropology at UCLA, and the author most recently of a really excellent book, Effective Justice, the International Criminal Court and the Pan-Africanist Pushback. We hope you'll join us for that. And thank you both to you and for coming. Thank you.